Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. It's a bonus edition this week, the 2020 Budget Edition. More than five months delayed with the pandemic, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg has declared Australia will not fall on its knees despite facing the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. In his 2020 budget, business appears to come out the major winner, along with people who need upskilling and of course workers who will receive tax cuts. But is it going to be enough? With the $100 billion JobKeeper stimulus planned to roll off in March, coupled with non-existent foreign immigration and headwinds for the Australian property market, can Scott Morrison's supply-side budget solve the imminent demand deficits? Here to run through our thoughts on the corona budget and to discuss how they may be incorporated in our portfolios, I'm joined by Nucleus Wells Head of Investments, Damien Klassen. Hello to you, Damien. Hi, Tim. Also on the line, we have our Chief Strategist, David Llewellyn-Smith. Hi, David. G'day, Tim. And also joining us, we have our Chief Economist, Leith Van Onselen. Hello to you, Leith. <laughs> G'day, Tim. Wonderful. Good to have you all on. And just a quick reminder that before we get started, to subscribe on YouTube and click on the notification bell to be notified of when we go live or have a new webinar to watch, or follow us on your preferred podcast platform. And for those listening in live, feel free to drop in your questions in the chat boxes at either nucleuswealth.com forward slash webinar or the YouTube's comments box to have them answered along the way. So let's jump into the agenda for today. So we're, of course, going to be facing off straight away into the budget numbers and policies. Looking then at the economic impacts, uh, looking across to then market impacts and also political impacts. And then finally wrapping up as we always do with an investment outlook and how we use these themes every day here at Nucleus Wealth and the MB Fund. So to kick us off, I'll hand over to our Chief Economist, Leith Van Onselen, uh, to, to pick up on the budget numbers and policies, Leith. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I thought I'd give everyone a quick uh, overview of, um, of the federal budget. Uh, which was obviously delivered last last Tuesday night, and uh, I guess you know just just look at the at, at the broad strokes here. Um, the federal budget projects a deficit of 214 billion this financial year, so that's 2020, 2020, 2020, uh, 2021, and then also uh, that that budget deficit then projected to halve uh, halve over the over the following financial year. So. Um, Although, that, although those are obviously big numbers, and that and that provides a fair bit of fiscal support to the economy, um, the the fiscal support is actually going to get pulled back um, over over coming years, uh, which will obviously pull out um, money out of the economy. Now, in terms of you know policy measures, budgets always include quite lots of them. There's there's in fact uh, dozens of policy measures, but basically there's only really three that uh, three three major ones that. That, that, that are of, uh, of much note. Uh, first of all, and this is probably the most interest to most, uh, most listeners, um, the federal budget brought forward the stage two tax cuts. Um, and they also, uh, th those were meant to come in, uh, in, I think next financial year, uh, if not the one after, and those have been pulled, pulled forward into this current financial year. And, um, and they're actually allowed to be claimed right now. So, uh, sorry, to last financial year. So you can effectively claim them retrospectively. And, and what this means is that uh, basically around 7 million taxpayers, um, once you do your tax return for the last financial year, the one just gone, um, they'll, they'll, around 7 million taxpayers will receive about $2,000 to $2,500 each um, back on their tax. So that's obviously additional household disposable income. So yeah, yippee, yippee. Um, on top of that, there's also, uh, the other I big think, policy. I think it's backdated only to last July, right? Yeah, that's right. But but they can. They, uh, they've only they only expect it's about a seventeen billion dollar policy, but they only expect seven of it in this coming in this present financial year. Yeah. So so the um, so, so that would be, be, be PAYG and various other shenanigans, right? Yeah, that's right. So. So basically, instead of instead of waiting till 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 next um, the, the financial year, the, the end of this financial year, so June next year, they've basically bought it back, so you can claim it yeah. now. 
and get some money now. And and, and the whole idea behind that was just basically to to, to give uh, you know to boost household disposal income now, give people extra extra purchasing power, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, to try and boost demand. Um, the next the next big uh, I'll, I'll go back into the implications of this a bit later on, but the the next major policy announcement was that uh, small, medium, and large businesses with turnovers of up to five billion dollars um, will be allowed to write off the full value of any eligible asset uh, up until June 2022, so for the next uh, two financial years. Um, and and that that policy is obviously designed to bring forward business investment uh, and you know to to boost growth and productivity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, finally. The only other policy which was really worth worth any note was um, was the job maker credit, hiring credit. So effectively, we know that that uh, the, the job seeker supplement is going to roll off uh, January one. Um, so, so effectively, that's going to fall by another two hundred and fifty dollars the supplement uh, per fortnight from from January uh, the upcoming January, and also the job keeper scheme is also expected is legislated to finish in march next year uh, and it's going to taper over that period so those of those will be replaced by something called the job maker hiring credit which i affectionately like to call uh, profit keeper um <laughs> and, and what that basically allows is is uh, is any major enterprise uh, so that basically means um businesses other than the major banks um that 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 hire younger australians aged between 16 to 35 will receive a subsidy for hiring those workers and that subsidy is going to be paid at the rate of 200 dollars per week for those who are aged under 30 and 100 bucks per week for those aged between 30 and 35 and that's obviously designed to uh to try and bring down um the very high youth unemployment and obviously australia's youth have been hit very hard by the, the uh by the COVID 19 19 pandemic and so it's designed to to boost employment and encourage firm, firms to uh to obviously employ more young people and the australian treasury estimates that this is this this will support about 450,000 jobs for young people now um unfortunately what the the budget was more notable for what it didn't include um what what i was hoping to see and what i know dave was hoping to see was uh was an was an increase in the uh job seeker unemployment benefit so um that that was increased temporarily by 500 dollars uh per fortnight when the, when COVID 19 hit and that 500 dollars supplement um, ran through uh, from from uh, March through to September 30 or September September 27, and it's now been um, tapered down uh, by $250, so about halved. And from January 1, um, job seekers uh, supposed to fall back to its old level of pitiful level, I should say, of $40 per day from January 1. Um, now Australia's unemployment benefits were already the, ver the the very lowest in the OECD before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Uh, they were about 30% below the poverty line. So from January 1, uh, everyone who's unemployed and is on JobSeeker is going to have basically $40 a day to live on, which is very a very significant oversight of the budget. Uh, also, the budget include bugger all for public works projects. So it had very little in the way of infrastructure, uh, nothing or well, effectively nothing in the way of uh, of public housing and social housing had a, had a few bits of scraps, um, but basically th this was effectively a supply side budget that had you know obviously money uh, had, had um, you know provided a little bit of demand supporting tax cuts, um, obviously tried to spur on some business investment and is trying to spur on uh, you know employers to hire hire more young people through the job maker credit, but you know it was really not a lot in there and the way I characterised this budget when it came out was really a uh, first and second year, um, the, the the type of budget you see in the first or second year of a new government. Uh, so it's not, you know, when when they when they obviously don't need to pork barrel the electorate. It was very conservative, um, and uh, you know, the 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 major problem with it is is that because we've got JobKeeper getting cut, and and uh, it'll be gone by March one next year, and because jobs the job seeker supplements are expected to disappear. And we also have um, that there are a bunch of other small measures, like for example, uh, Australians have been access, been able to access ten thousand dollars of um, the superannuation in the first half of this year and ten thousand dollars in the second half of each year. Uh, that that's now going to disappear. Uh, and be, because all those measures are basically rolling off, uh, Australia is facing what what we call a, a, a ginormous fiscal cliff, 
which is effectively um, all the supports that, that we've had in the six months leading up to late September, uh, they've already been cut by about 40% with the cut in the job seeker and job keeper supplement. And from January um, next year, they're supposed to be about two thirds less than what they were um, in the first six months. And, so so uh, are, we, are we on this next slide? Is that where you're looking at? Oh, sorry, yes, yes. So we're, yes sorry. we're going to spend. Because probably we That's just right. worked. For anyone, for anyone listening in, we've got a couple of slides up there, um, and it's worth just noticing, noting, you know, there's three, basically three charts. Um, the first one is sort of showing that the, uh, the, the fiscal cliff from from third quarter, um, 2020, to fourth quarter is is quite dramatic. So it drops from spending over 100 billion to, to back to maybe about 30, um, and then falling away from there. And then uh, another one's just sort of showing the the stimulus withdrawals, and in particular, of note is that. Um, so at the end of October is when uh, there's a big, I think about a 38% drop in terms of the the, um, the the amount of spend, and then there's another another drop, sort of brings it back to, well, it's a total 67%, but it doesn't. I think it's probably cumulative. I'm guessing um, uh, in January, so there's sort of the two big drops, one in one in October to, through to November, and then the other one in in from December to January where there's big drops. And then the final part is that that, that poverty line stuff. Uh, Leith was talking about just showing that the the job, uh, the new start and job keeper is is basically miles below uh, the poverty line, and the gap is widening. That's right. It's also it's also um, way below the age pension, so it's a bit of a lost opportunity. And effectively, by mid next year, uh, all this temporary support, you know, excluding the tax cuts, but all the job keeper jobs etc., um, is expected to be gone fully gone so that's all that money that that uh, that households have been receiving while well, they've been unemployed or obviously you know furloughed from their jobs is gone and um that's that's the budget uh and and the main <laughs> problem is um the, the australian private sector has already been in recession uh for uh, since since um i think september last year uh, sorry since since december last year so we've had uh december the december quarter the march quarter and the june quarter the private sector was already in recession, uh, and following up. The and, and sorry, Leith, I just should qualify that for, for anyone listening in is what what Leith means is that the only reason why the the, the GDP Australia's GDP didn't go backwards was because government spending was was bailing it out for those uh, two two quarters. Yeah, so so there's so so there's a chart on the next page which which Dave can speak to in a second, but it's uh, it's worth having a look at. Um, what what I've done. There is, we've got uh, final demand. So final demand is a better measure of economic growth in Australia. Uh, GDP is the one usually used, but GDP includes obviously net exports and net imports. But if you want to look at just spending within the economy, final demand's the a much better expenditure. Uh, sorry, much better measure. And um, final demand was actually, already actually. Sorry, Leith, before you before you get off that, can we just talk this um, some of this the, the job keeper job seeker stuff? Because I'm interested to see this. Um, you know, we've got some of these big drops within the. Uh, uh, in terms of these wage subsidies that, that have rolled off, I thought it was actually so. So I guess this this must be a cash flow payment. This is talking about because I thought it, it finished at the end of September, but but I guess the cash flow continued on into October. Is that what it's suggesting? Yeah. So um, it, it, it's a bit strange. Like the, these these charts tend to be lagged by a month. Yeah. Um, so so I think because uh, because because employers can claim um, they they basically claim it in arrears. So they're always a month ahead. So, so effectively, they, you know, if if um, if the ATO is handing out payments for September, the payments go 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 through into the economy in October. So right, it's basically okay. it's basically one month lag, and and it's the same uh, it's the same where you can see that the um, the the stimulus falls really in February when in fact uh, job keeper uh, and job seeker supplement um, actually end or uh, well, they get cut or or end uh, on December thirty one mm. thereabouts. And then the, so, um, <clears throat> there's a jump up for Q3 next year, which is the. I'm not quite sure what that is. Tax cuts. Is that another? Oh, okay. That's another set of tax cuts coming through as people actually yeah. take those payments. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so effectively, the, the, these two charts, the first and second chart on this um, on this page, are effectively the same data presented in a different way. Um, all yeah. similar data presented in a different way. So one's from UBS, one's from McKinsey, uh, and, and we could have put a third one from Grattan, but they all tell the same story. Uh, that effectively, you know, from next month, 
um, we're going to start seeing the, the, the economy is start. So from November, the economy is going to start seeing a big reduction in yeah. uh, in, 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 in in household disposable income because of these pullbacks in. Yeah. In and and if, if so, if we're going to put it in, a, in an analogy, you know, we're starting a marathon to, to get out of this and, and we've sprinted out of the blocks and then we're going to uh, slow to a walk once we've. Uh, yeah. And it's, well, it's, and it's right, actually, slower. Well, it's to a crawl, isn't it, really? But, <laughs> but the, the scale, the scale of it is pretty immense. Like Q two, Q three, twenty twenty this year had basically seventeen percent of GDP annualised in giveaways, mm. and we're going to take those back over the subsequent two quarters, three quarters actually. Uh, so, in other words public demand um, to its contribution to growth is just about to go backwards yeah. 17% of GDP. Well, yeah, but, but, but also though, I mean, there is, some, there is a decent amount of offset in terms of with, you know, the lockdowns and everything across the country. So, so it's not, yeah. So a chunk of that filled a hole, but it obviously overfilled the hole. Uh, and yes. now some of that hole, the, the hole that's, that's, that's sort of left behind isn't going to fill up. Isn't isn't going to go back to where we were, say, last year quickly, um, but uh, but the stimulus side is. So we're, yeah, we've gone from overfilling the hole to, to underfilling the hole. Yeah, which is well, a very that, jumping that, off point for our for our next page. Yeah, it is. So, I, 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 I'll just finish my last point and then, then we can see yeah. to Dave. That that that's basically um, the million dollar question here. So basically, the federal government is banking on as they pull the stimulus away real quick that the economy is going to magically do a V-shaped recovery. And, and they're going to basically pass the baton. So the unemployed people are going to suddenly go into job. Uh, they're going to go from being welfare into work, et cetera. And, um, and, and we're not going to get this big demand shock. But, you know, we, we, can't, uh, we can't see that happening smoothly. And, um, yeah, Dave, Dave can talk to that with the next chart uh, on final demand. Yeah, okay. So there's a range of reasons listed here why we think that this will be much more problematic than, than Treasury and the Treasurer hope. The, the number one driver is traditional Keynesian stimulus, which is what the media has largely represented this budget as, is designed to offset um, retrenching private sector spending and investment decisions. Like when they go backwards because of fading confidence, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe balance sheet problems, whatever they happen to be, uh, then there's just too much uncertainty. Then the government steps in with direct spending and investment. And in fact, there's a blog post today, we, we didn't put any of the material in here, but from the IMF, with its incredibly large database showing the history of Keynesian counter-cyclical stimulus and how it works when you have uncertainty inhibiting the private sector. Uh, and what the government has done is simply taken a bet that that won't happen this time in this context in this country. Uh, so, you know, what Keynes called it was the paradox of thrift. When you have, a, you know, a difficulty in the private sector and, and households and businesses start to save, uh, and then, you know, you, you have to find a way to get them to spend again. Uh, and that can be quite difficult to do, especially if you don't lead them there with some public spending. So that's the kind of context in which these various headwinds that we've listed here, we think pose a problem for the way the budget is structured. Yeah. So actually, can, can, I, can I overlay one more over the top of that as well, David? Because there's that, yep. the paradox of thrift, as you said, is that this whole thing about, um, you know, we, you want to get people spending again to, to get it going so you can get back to where you were. But but we've, uh, and not just Australia, plenty of other uh, economies, but Australia is probably one of the worst around the world has built uh, an economy not just based on people spending, but actually people borrowing to to spend. Like our, yes. our it's been much much greater than our income for I don't know twenty years, and so um, yeah, so so it's actually a it's not even just the it's not even just get people confident enough to out to go and spend. You need to get them confident enough to go out and to borrow in order to um, to spend as oh. well. It's sort of that one extra one extra level above uh, yes. to do what what Keynes would have considered. Quite right. I mean, there are, uh, following that enormous public drop of income that we've just discussed, there are some decent household savings that might get unwound a little, it'll help. 
but we still don't think it'll be enough. So you've got the fiscal cliff and you obviously have had an unemployment shock. It's still quite severe. And while we go off the fiscal cliff over the next six months is unlikely to improve. In fact, it will very likely get worse as various firms that have supported their workers with government help over the last year or so, uh, are, you know, they come back to work and find that they just simply don't have the demand for their workforce. And so we'll see reduced headcounts. On top of that, uh, I'm, in my many business contacts, they all say the same thing about what has just happened during the lockdowns. That is, they all discovered that they were carrying a lot of fat in their processes, and their systems and their, their factories and, and uh, their output. Uh, and they, you know, once they shut down, they, they discovered a million and one ways of being more efficient. And so they're obviously going to implement that when they come back. And so that's going to kind of also, it's a big efficiency and productivity boost, but it's definitely going to hit headcount as we reopen as well. Uh, then on top of that, this, this one is particularly uh, a challenge for Australia, and that is the, the mass immigration crash, which uh, we're looking at basically negative um, population growth for two years. Is that that more or less? No, the, no, 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 no. no. So, 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 so immigration, net overseas migration, next two financial years is projected to fall by about a hundred thousand, but. Because of population growth, the natural increase, um, Australia's population growth is projected next year to go to, go to grow by only fifty thousand, and the year yeah. after that by about ninety thousand. But that, but that's down from roughly four hundred thousand yeah. uh, previously per year, or you know three eighty to four hundred thousand. So we're, we're talking about a quarter. Uh, sorry, well, yeah, more like an eighth of yeah, um, yeah. Of, of of what the population growth we've experienced over yeah. recent times. Have you seen have you seen anything Leith, that tracks the um, uh, the household formation say because because it, it I, guess, I guess in a way you know it doesn't really matter if, if there's a whole bunch of extra kids born because they're being born into kid, into households that are already there it probably more, matters more about whether um, yeah that that whole household formation idea about uh, eighteen year olds or twenty year olds or 30, 31 year olds nowadays moving out to well, get their so, own place. So, so, Certainly, uh, certainly, I haven't actually seen any data about that, but anecdotally, you're spot on because natural increase will come from people having babies, obviously. Um, mm. But but also, but but more importantly, in times of recession, and this is you know through throughout history, uh, it doesn't matter what country you look at. Um, in times of recession, you tend to get a higher number of people per dwelling because obviously kids kids move back home because they're, they're struggling financially, have more group houses, et cetera, et cetera, or kids delay leaving home. Uh, and, and so because of that, um, you know, obviously having a big reduction in population growth uh, is going to have a bigger impact on, uh, on, on, you know, housing oversupply. You need to build more dwellings, more everything. Uh, mm. Because, because uh, not only do you have less people coming in or less, less population growth, you've also got um, less need for dwellings because people are staying home longer or they're moving in moving back home or sharing group houses so yeah, uh, yeah. so household yeah. formation might that's be right. negative yeah. that's right yeah absolutely yeah which which brings us to the, to the really important point to make about trying to stimulate supply in the budget and that is there's oversupply in everything uh, especially the the sectors that are most exposed to mass immigration that have been building out so furiously for the last decade or so. Uh, anyone reading the blog will have seen these fantastic charts on what is an unprecedented uh, residential property oversupply. But is the same, precisely the same thing is transpiring in all uh, dimensions of commercial property uh, with work from home, office, uh, Oversupply and, va and vacancy rates are, are going to go through the roof. Retail's already gone through the roof, and capital prices are plunging in retail. Vacancy rates are through the roof for, re for retail. Uh, and so, you know, that's that's obviously capex stuff, but that that applies as a, an analogy pretty much across the entire economy. We've got an oversupply in just about everything, and. You know, then you, you present a budget which tries to stimulate more supply, uh, which is a very strange way to think about it. Uh, and it does so by, by not by using tax cuts, but by accelerated depreciation uh, for, for the businesses that Leith discussed. 
And that isn't particularly a particularly strong incentive either with interest rates so low because all you're really saving is, you know, the risk-free rate uh, on foregone future depreciation. And yeah. So, so what, what David means by that is if, if I want to spend, you know, a million dollars today to build a new factory is that I'd then depreciate that over whatever, 10 years, and I'd get to pull back my depreciation every year. Whereas now I get to take that that 10 years all up front. So so I get a big tax kick for this year, but um, yeah, at the expense of a future yes. uh, tax. So so it's good. So I'm not saying it's a good thing to do, but it's, but uh, the question is if, if my existing factory is only running at 70%, then why do I want to buy, build a new factory? Yes, exactly. And then the incentive to do it's just not that high. Then you've got the issue of hurdle rates for investment, which are still quite high for most businesses and corporations. And I don't think that these de depreciation incentives will be enough to get um, most decisions over those hurdle rates. And that, that is what is the rate of return, expected return on yeah. investment. Except, except for that one big one, David, that I know you're probably about to get to, but I have to jump in and, and beat you to it, is that, that with my factory that I'm building, you know, my existing factories needs 300 people to, to run it. You know, my, my new factory is only going to need 50 because I'm going to automate everything I can. Exactly. And so that's, yep. that's yep. the only one that's uh, worth doing. Yeah. Yes. And so the only reason to invest is to reduce your headcount <laughs> is, <laughs> is the upshot, uh, which, which, we don't, we don't give the wrong impression. Like in normal circumstances, this is quite good and it helps helps the productivity and income for the overall economy. But when you're in this the circumstance of such slack on the supply side, you've got underutilized stuff across the economy, then the vast majority of businesses are simply going to sweat their existing assets and try and sweat them even harder than they would than they were before, rather than expand or or put on yes. You know, new employees. So it's a very kind of ill-conceived targeting of the area of the economy that leads it. <laughs> needs it yeah. the least. Yeah. And the and the other thing is, um, you know, the, so so the Australian government's for you know foregone all that revenue. So for, for over the, in the future for for this one-off big hit now, but um, you know when when the guys who's building this factory goes out and buys a whole bunch of machines, he's not buying them from Australians. He may as well cut a check no. to uh, to the US and China to, um, you know, to, to buy the technology because yes. it's not, it's a, it's a, it's not like you've said, here's some money, go and go and buy it from other Australians and that'll put those guys into work. It's basically, here's some money, go, go send it overseas. Yes, that's right. Uh, there's one final thing to add and that is this goes to demand deficit again. Uh, that, and, just harking back to the one attempted uh, demand stimulus measure in the budget, which is the tax cut, which typically <laughs> typically don't work anyway as a stimulus measure. They're, they're quite often saved. And we did this, in fact, at the end of last year, and it did nothing for consumption. As Lee said, the private sector fell into recession as we did. And, and, and also... And, and also the national well, state, the household savings rates rate went through the roof after last tax cut, which just meant yeah, people saved exactly. It. And that was all before COVID, right? So now we're post COVID and they're going to do it again because as we know, when you're an ideological nutter, fail the first time, you double down. Uh, but the thing is the tax cut, as the budget numbers themselves say, it's only $7 billion this financial year. Uh, all of it, that we have to wait until next July before most of it even arrives. So we're going to have all of these um, headcount reduction policies over the next nine months with basically almost no demand stimulus. Uh, so it's it's a it's a real crazy punt. This budget. It's not something that I've basically seen in my lifetime for a, a budget that that landed amid cyclical difficulties, uh, not in any country. And that that kind of brings us to the, the uh, politics of it. Well, I suppose maybe we, should we quickly do politics and come back to markets or should we do markets? Oh, either way. Yeah, we can jump across the politics if you want. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, it just sort of segues with, with the end of that discussion, I guess. So, sure. So it is a supply side budget without precedent, especially in, in the cyclical circumstances. It's not conceit, not Keynesian. The other day I argued it was a bit Austrian. I was being a little tongue in cheek. It's not really Austrian either because it 
depends very heavily on passing demand to the RBA, which is about loose credit. That's not Austrian. Um, it's wacko trickle down stuff from a wacko trickle down government, uh, which is basically, you know, cut taxes for your mates in the corporate sector and they'll take care of the rest of us. Um, so as a result, we see a very weak recovery next year, especially in wages, and that very much deals Labor back into the election. Uh, sets up the possibility of this being an Abbott style budget from 2014, where we had our de debt and deficit disaster budget in, in uh, inverted commas, uh, which so smashed confidence, private sector confidence, that Abbott was gone 12 months later as Prime Minister. Um, and so you, you can't discount the possibility, the distinct possibility of the government doing a, a very swift U turn on its own budget. It did put aside a very large slush fund in the budget in the, in the event that it didn't work. I think it was about 50 billion, uh, was it, Lee? Um, which was reserved for possible new COVID outbreaks, etc. But I wouldn't be surprised if they were forced to use it to bail out their own budget. So politics became yeah, could get for sure. um, an interesting question. So with that background, we can uh, flip back to markets. Dave, Dave, can, can I just interject for a second? Yeah. You know, is it worth maybe is it worth maybe just saying, you know, what 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 they should have done before um before getting to that or? Uh, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, we, could be, just... we could be here all afternoon, couldn't we? If we were going to start get what they should oh, have done. No, no, no. no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> it's, very honestly, it's very straight. It's very straight. You you've touched on half of it already. Yeah. yeah. You want to you want to boost just, the automatic stabilizers, so bigger job job just... seeker. And, yep. and and invest and a whole lot of money in infrastructure, public works. And public housing. Yeah, pub, so that, 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 that's public housing, public works. Yeah. That, that, lifts, that lifts demand, gets, then the private sector economy comes in on the back of that, and you start to get into a virtuous yeah. cycle. Labor did. And, and R&D. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And R&D, get out yeah. and... Whether it's green or not green, you know, if, if your political thing can't can't continence any green stuff, I'm sure there's some other scientific stuff things they could. Look, that, would, uh, that would be that is the other obvious thing you 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 would do, which the government has done the complete opposite, is that and some sort of green infrastructure stimulus as well, which yeah, well, labor, well, labor has mooted um, as an alternative. Instead, they did their their energy, you know, unplanned to to dig up more expensive gas. Now that'll be slightly stimulatory in the short term, given they need to employ some more miners and et cetera, but if it won't lower our energy prices, it doesn't do anything much. So, uh, yeah, sorry, Lee. Just say something real quick. Yeah, yeah, just said something real quick. I mean, you know, Infrastructure Australia releases the infrastructure priorities list every year where it has about 20 projects, which they say, they, they, these are national priorities. Um, the federal government should simply have just grabbed the first 10 of that or whatever and just said, great, here we go. We're going to, you know, we're now going to build these X. Simple as that. And uh, gone on a massive public housing spending spree. Um, and that's pretty much that. And raising job, job seeker, the two sort of, you know, talking broad strokes here, um, the two sorts of things they should have done. Um, yep. but, I know. But of it, course, it, 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 it isn't rocket surgery. I, no, it's not. <laughs> You're exactly right. Anyway, so what they've done instead is completely understimulate and and encourage business to sack workers. And so, in effect, for the first uh, very serious implication for us then to consider when we look start looking at markets is what this does to monetary policy, and it basically leaves demand entirely to the RBA, um, which is of course out of ammunition. So uh, it'll do what it can. It'll include another rate cut. There'll be more QE, there'll be more nationalisation of bank bonds uh, to try and drive down mortgage rates. And uh, maybe it'll move out, it should move out the uh, the, the duration of the bond curve by longer dated bonds. Uh, and hopefully it will help offset this demand deficit by buying state government bonds as well, where you know there'd be more infrastructure investment if they do. But the main point is uh, that this, this forces the RBA to ease more. Now, a, a lot of commentary coming out of these buy side and brokers and what have you has taken this completely upside down. Uh, and because the government increased the deficits, rather than looking at the quality of what they were doing, they were looking at quantity. A lot of people have said the RBA doesn't need to cut now. 
uh, that may slow the RBA um, a little bit, given it's the whole thing is so reactive and conser conservative and, um, you know, worried about its reputation and these things. But at the end of the day, the, the economy is just going to force its hand. We certainly think it will move in November and I think it will be forced to move again very quickly in the new year because demand is just going to be so shit. Um, so that, that sets us up for, uh, you know, the, probably Australia's last bond bull market because we still have, you know, quite high yields relative to the rest of the world and certainly in terms of risk yeah. as well, risk adjusted, our bond market is very well priced. Um, the other component of that is the budget was also very aggressive about the impact of vaccines, et cetera, next year. And so it's extremely likely to miss all its targets uh, and it'll need a lot more to be issuing more debt than it currently thinks it, it's going to. Uh, so uh, that, that also means um, that it gets pretty complicated at this point as we sort of refer to how Australian yields will react to global yields as, as you know, other nations come out of COVID uh, with the US election and, and, and troubles in Europe with its Brexit, a, a resurgence, of, resurgence of COVID over winter and all these places as well. Um, but the, the basic point to make is that Australian yields are going to fall from here pretty consistently and you'll probably see, at least once the Dems get in next year, increased fiscal stimulus in the US, which for a time at least is likely to lift US yields uh, as you know, bond market starts to price in a bit of recovery and a little bit of increased inflation. I'm not, certainly not talking about inflation breakout. Uh, and so the bond, uh, sorry, the yield uh, spread between the US and Australia should compress and, and indeed it's already inverted again uh, at, at certain certain parts of the curve, which will pressure the so, Australian what, dollar. What, sorry, just David, just um, for people who, who are not sure what that means. So basically that you usually see, you used, you used to always see that the Australian interest rates were higher than the um, US interest, interest rates. And that was because Australia needed a lot of capital. Um, yeah. And uh, that was sort of a bit of a feature and, and uh, but recently, that's um, yeah, that that hasn't been the case. Yes. So what what it's called the carry trade, where people borrow in one currency and then invest it in another higher interest rates than they borrowed it at. But obviously, if you keep lowering your interest rates, you put that off, and so less people buy your currency. Uh, so we see the Australian dollar is struggling next year. Difficult to know exactly when it peaks. It'll also rely on commodity prices, etc. But they should be weakening too. Uh, once you know Brazil comes online, but I don't want to get too uh, with iron ore, etc. Let's not get too lost in those factors. But the basic thrust of it is that the budget means the Australian dollar bill will be lower than it would have been otherwise. Uh, so uh, the other thing that that kind of leads us directly to from interest rates, of course, is property, and we've already seen you know more more positive in impact on house prices perhaps than we expected. Uh, from the, the, the lower interest rates that we've already seen. Uh, I don't want to get too carried away with that statement, but certainly the cities where immigration was less important, uh, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, uh, peripheral capitals, if we call them that, um, have seen rising, pro uh, well, flat and rising prices in the last six months uh, and seem, seem to be warming into some kind of positive cycle. So we expect that will probably continue as the RBA is forced to do more. Uh, but the southeast is still in a lot of trouble on all of the oversupply that we've described, the difficulty it has with, uh, with falling immigration. Uh, and so it's hard to see, you know, much in terms of bullish price action in the southeast. And Melbourne's still really struggling. Sydney's managed to stabilise, but can't see it running too far. Well, Leith, are you? Does that roughly accord with your view? Yeah, it does. I, I, I think uh, obviously Melbourne's going to be the be the weakest, um, just because of lockdown. But also we're um, oh God, uh, we're, we're most immigration dependent. But also, uh, yeah, Sydney's. Um, can you guys hear me? Someone's yeah. Uh, yeah. put a jackhammer in my wall. I'll just uh, I'll just I'll just mute my mic. So yeah, I mean, the the economic impact of that is any kind of wealth effect 
you know, where people take the new, newly won uh, or enjoyed equity in their asset prices and cash that in on spending uh, is likely to be pretty muted. Uh, as we said, household savings have been lifting, you know, with, a, with all of the generous stuff fiscal stuff over the last nine months, but, and that, that's sure to reverse to some extent, which would be a bit supportive, but there's probably not much wealth effect coming through house prices uh, with some capitals enjoying it, but are being offset by weak, weakness in others. So that goes towards the demand deficit as well and, and continues to, you know, way towards more RBA easing. Uh, and when you get into this circumstance where you effectively at zero interest rates and you're still trying to find ways of lowering mortgage rates, which is what the RBA is, is now doing by buying Australian bank bonds that they used to sell to the private sector at high interest rates and are now refinancing at the RBA at very low ones, which increases their margins and allows them to cut mortgage rates. That is, you know, a game of diminishing returns because the uh, the banks still have 60% of deposits they can't lower anymore. And so every time they cut margin, uh, mortgage rates, uh, they lose more margin. And so it, this is what happened to Japanese banks and European banks through their crises. Basically, bank margins just continually fall away. And you end up you know, slowly nationalising your banks on the quiet and and eating, uh, eating them uh, and, and their capacity to issue credit, even as you're trying to save the very asset prices that they, you know, juiced into such high levels. Uh, so it's really the end game for the banks and for your property bubble. Yeah. Well, and the other thing we didn't, didn't talk about is that we, um, we started from the, the basically the second worst position in the world in terms of uh, in terms of consumer debt. debt. So, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so, so that's obviously a big head headwind as well. So, the, you know, I mean, at the moment, the Australian banks are ignoring some of these forces, at least for the last week or so. They've had a run as global banks have gone up, and I'm now talking about stocks pretty much. But, you know, it's difficult to see that lasting in these circumstances with still a lot of bad debt, headwinds, margin pressures from what will need to be an aggressive RBA. Uh, and so the banks should struggle. Uh, but that's that's really, the, I guess, the important thing to note about that for the Australian stocks and stock market is it's an analogy for suffering from weak domestic demand. Uh, so all, you know, anything exposed to Australian domestic demand is going to struggle to increase earnings. And we've been tracking the Q3 reporting across the world, earnings reporting season, uh, and it's shaping up to be pretty good in the US where... Uh, median, the median stock might actually, or may, median earnings at this stage look like they might be on track to replicate 2019, uh, which is, you know, a pretty, pretty outstanding recovery for earnings. I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's uh, all perfect getting there. Yeah, and it, and actually, it was worth prefacing though as well, Dave, to say that there's a, the sector mix is not, is, is still not. Um, I guess re representative, like the, the, these yeah. companies who have seen re report so far, is, is very particularly concentrated in, in some sectors that, that probably aren't represent representative of the entire market. Yes, it, it, it would ease. It's not representative yet. But the, the the major point is that relative to us to Australian earnings, yeah, uh, we, were, we were still minus twenty percent on twenty nineteen, with almost no lift from the bottom uh, in terms of the outlook, uh, yeah. which which we. Pre Pretty much agree with that. Other in Australian stocks is through multiple expansion, won't be through earnings. Not impossible, but it obviously makes it a bit more difficult. Um, we've got a handful of questions that have come in just while we've um, sure. been running through those markets. So if you want, we can maybe pause and, and just take those. Um, yep. First one here. So thanks to MD. Uh, do you think both low interest rates uh, now and the now attempted immediate tax cuts with no medium term infrastructure projects that diversify our economy. Do you think that we're going to sabotage a recovery? Oh, I think that's 100% what this, uh, this presentation is about. <laughs> um, we have sabotaged the recovery. I think the only, re only uh, redeeming feature in the budget is that it put aside $50 billion as a slush fund to, uh, to throw out the economy if it fails. And I think it will. 
So, yeah. I, mean, and it's, I guess I'd probably say though, like it's sabotage it in terms of saying if you had to spent it just in a, if you had to just said let, let's just take everything we're existing spending on existingly and, and, and increase it by a lot to to get it. I guess what I was saying is it's not, it's not really sabotage in terms of it's, it's a positive. Like if you did, if you did nothing, if you step back and said okay, we're just not going to do anything and and good luck guys, we'll get out of this eventually, then that that would be. Um, that might sabotage your recovery. Like mm. this isn't going to inhibit. The, it's not going to inhibit the recovery. But really, what it's saying is the amount of money we're spending. You should have done way, way, way better for the amount of money you're spending. Mm. Like it's, a lot of it's going to be that's, wasted in terms of sent right. overseas. Yes, that's right. But very low, very low calorie. It's done, it, low calorific, but it's also a bad recovery because largely because it's it's so basically because it's so unfair. Yeah. You know, well, it's, it's, it's just trying to get back to where we used to be. It's assuming where we were was a good spot with lots of debt. Yes. Yeah, if you if you all you're going to do is 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 encourage businesses to re reduce headcount through tax incentives, then what you're going to get is very very weak wages, and and you'll get no no income growth to push demand, and that'll hit the top line of the same firms. So, you know, there's nothing in here that gives you a virtuous cycle through which to recover. So I mean, I, I the, both both Morrison and, and Frydenberg were weirdly defensive of the few days after the budget and over the weekend in the press, as because the, the criticism of the budget was pretty meek in the media. Not really, MB was the only one that got to the nub of it anywhere near close. But they were like, "Oh yeah, if it doesn't work, we'll just do more of the same." <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, you know, and and. It was just strange, it's strangely been a very strange budget discussion, post budget discussion, worryingly so, in, in my from my point of view, because such an ill conceived budget is uh, uh, demands a robust economic debate, and we haven't had it except at MB. There's going, don't get me wrong, there's going to be an economic recovery because you know Victoria is going to reopen. Hmm. It's not that we're going to stay in recession, but the recovery is going to suck. When it when it should be a boom because you've got all this catch up growth from being shut down, plus then you put, throw in some appropriate demand stimulus to get people working and lift incomes, get reflation going. You know this is a deflationary budget that you've launched at completely the wrong moment. Yep. Yeah. It is. This is the budget if you've if, if you're well, maybe not the maybe not the 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 dollar amount of the the deficit but but if, if you were starting to run into inflationary concerns mm. and wages were, were growing too quickly yep. you might then launch a, a similar type of the policy policy structure in terms of saying how can we get wages down and incre improve productivity absolutely that's what leith was saying before this is like a mid cycle mm. yeah where you would do precisely that and and that's why we say it's not that it's intrinsically bad like not at all. It's just the time. It's just the wrong. It's the wrong budget at at, at the wrong time. Yep. Yes. Exactly yeah. right. So yeah, they've loaded they've loaded enough ammunition into the uh, into the thing. They've just aimed it in the wrong direction. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. At their own foot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a um, couple more questions, uh, gents, and thanks to everyone that's popping them into uh, into the various uh, chats here. Um, so uh, what's the long-term, so in brackets, decade forecast on interest rates? Uh, a decade of zero rates, question mark. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> well, lock that in. <laughs> the the, the upshot of leaving a demand deficit, leaving the RBA to, to deal with it through trying to prompt more private debt, is that you are going to have to nationalise the bank's debt and addict everybody to zero interest rate, mm. to zero and eventually negative interest rates, and this is the end of rate hikes forever mm. until such a time that someone somewhere else decides that we need to do you know monet monetarily funded fiscal. In, on such a scale, when we're talking about mon modern monetary theory, that we actually get some inflation and wage inflation, etc., and that we might might give us a price of capital back. But the path that this budget takes you down is Japan endlessly lower interest rates. Mm -hmm. And and it's worth noting though as well is that the um, the the cash rate that the RBA reports is no longer important in, in our view. Is is what's uh -huh. important is actually the the rate on the term. Uh, term funding facility, term fund facility, 
TFF. TFF. Anyway, yeah. so what what that is is that's the one which lets banks. Um, that, so the RBA gives this to banks, and banks can then lend on a three year basis to to households and to to businesses, and basically they're giving it away um, well cheaper than than um, anyone else. The market, yeah. and so. Uh, and, and what happened in Europe is they introduced that first and then they just made it lower and lower and lower and now they're at the stage of paying the banks 1% <laughs> just so the banks will lend. Yeah. And that's and where, you, and so that's and that's the actual, in terms of businesses and, and the, the property market, that's the only rate that matters in Europe. Um, you know, what, whether they raise rates or lower rates doesn't really matter if, if they're going to keep up with this. Um, their one's called the LTRO. TLTRO. Yeah, it's just exactly right. And the other the other component of it is kind of qualitative, and that is like the the number of assets or the proportion of bank assets that, that they will buy. So they keep reducing the price, but they keep raising the ceiling on how much the bank will they'll buy. So this this is why you're effectively nationalising them over time. But you're absolutely right. The TFF is now monetary. So, so just on that, just um, before we shift over to a couple of questions on property, um, the so obviously you mentioned their uh, bond being a bond bull, uh, and you know this uh, I guess this direction we're headed, you know, following in the in the European footsteps. Did we see a, a big, you know, last hurrah in the bond market? Um, you know, as, as the the European banks sort of headed in that direction, well before us, fellas. Do you mean a bond oh well, bond actually, bond actually. Yeah. Actually, more than more than the last hurrah. I mean, they've gone to um, they've gone to negative rates. Like you know, that's mm, yeah. but that, that's and and deeply negative. Like you know, that you can get ten year um, German government bonds. I think it's almost one percent, negative one percent yeah. now. Yeah. So it's like yeah. like so. So maybe you know, if if we're truly headed in that direction, and and you are you know, you're, you're happy to buy bonds that will lose you money in the future, then then there's a chance for capital gain. Mm. Um, yes. Well, the, my answer is um, yes. That's the way yeah. we're going. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it may be that the RBA has to wait because it's so reactionary. It may have to wait for the Federal Reserve to go negative before it does yeah. it. But well, I noticed today the, the um, it, it, will be, it will have no choice. That's what this path does. Yep. Yeah, the Bank of England, David, and if you saw the Bank of England uh, overnight came out uh, telling its banks to um, to start. Uh, yeah, having a look at their books rate. to see what, yeah, <laughs> get ready. Tell us, tell us what's going to go wrong if we give you negative rates. So you got a bit of a chance to uh, fix it. Set yep. your, set, fix your software first before we uh, before we surprise yeah. you. So this is the, this is the last bond bull market. It, it, it's like the, it's like the Y two K bug for banking, basically. They just gonna... yeah. <laughs> All right, couple yeah. of, couple of questions on property here. Um, so I'll kick off with this one. What percentage downside do you envision on in property in Melbourne? Uh, and then also another one, just to follow on from that, will it go down in all sectors or just units, gents? Uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. De de definitely, definitely the market's most exposed. Um, we're already seeing, and this, and this was up until last month, uh, unit rent rents in um, in Melbourne have already fallen by about 5%. And given the profile of the uh, dwelling construction to come, which is concentrated quite heavily in units and also the big collapse in population growth, I'm um, expecting... Uh, and also the fact that investors are more concentrated in the unit market, um, I think you will 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 bear the brunt. Um, and also, I think I think just because of uh, the whole COVID nineteen thing, um, units are less attractive now as places to live. I think people, um, you know, they'll they'll uh, not only be a flight out of the inner city into the suburbs and into also the regions, they'll also be a flight away from units. Um, so yeah, the downside for the unit market is quite big. Um, for the house, for the detached house market, not nearly as big. Um, if I had to put it like Melbourne house prices are already down, dwelling dwelling values are already down six percent from peak, um, according to CoreLogix, and so six percent since March, effectively. Um, and I think they'll go double digits, but beyond then, uh, beyond that, who knows? Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, I, I think they'll definitely hit ten percent down, and uh, but given all uh, you know, lower interest rates and um, collapse in responsible lending rules and whatever it mm. should, uh, you okay, know, units, yeah, probably Please, bottom out. Lease do, do more downside than that. Oh, yeah, no, no, so, so, certainly units would be more, but I think, uh, yeah, so dwelling values overall, uh, you know, 10 percent ish uh, could be a bit more. Uh, but, but at the same time, um, 
it's probably going to be the last hurrah for property because if uh, you know if 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 interest rates fall, uh, uh, mortgage rates are already falling down about two percent. You can get two percent rates. I mean, how much lower can they go? Maybe one percent. Um, yeah, half, it, 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 half, half yeah, is the look, what's happening in Europe at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Maybe, maybe we might even get to half a percent, but. But, but I think I think you know Dave wrote a piece last week I think it was about how this is the last prop yeah you know, this could be the last property boom because uh, um, it gets to a point where the rates will get as low as they can possibly get and then after that um, you know and the, the and banks are effectively nationalised and etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, exactly right. yeah. so uh, all right yeah I mean look <laughs> any, anyone anyone listening take this with a very low confidence because uh, the property market's nuts and mm. uh, it's always changing and. Um, yeah, I see more downside from Melbourne, but, you know, I don't know how much. Very good. Um, okay, well, look, before we jump across to um, the investment uh, outlook, uh, I might just finish on one last one from a uh, from a listener, Bob. I won't expand on the rest of his name. Is there anything Australians can do? Irritate politicians, start a riot, join a group. Citizens don't seem to matter much in Australia these days. Uh, any, any, any notes there, fellas? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we try and provoke a riot pretty much every day. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't seem to work. <laughs> but, you know, any 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 kind of protest you can bring together is good. Yep. Yeah, I, I, uh, I unfortunately... Guess the, the problem is really that the, a lot of these policy settings, although certainly not this budget, this is a bit of a d- departure in terms of bipartisanship, but the problem to date, at least, has been bipartisanship in the policies that matter. And change things. So mm. Protesters has effectively had no political outlooks. Yeah, you know, I mean, let's let's take uh, energy policy as a, as a good. That's a good one, isn't it, Dave? It's uh, pretty much nothing between them, and they both contributed to the the stuff ups, and so ne- neither of them have a uh, an interest in in bringing it to light or, or fixing it. Certainly, sorry from from a gas pol- from a gas policy. That's uh, no, I think I think well, certainly while Labor was in power. That- yeah. I think if they yeah. go back in, they might do it differently. But uh, yes, absolutely, through Brad Gillard and then into the coalition, it was the same. Yes. Mm. It's basically... Yeah. Uh... Although one obviously had a carbon pricing scheme. So the broader yeah. energy policies were different. Yeah, yeah. Broad yeah, yeah, sorry. Gas, it's a yeah. gas policy. Yeah, yeah, gas policy. Specific gas policy, absolutely. Same with immigration, property. Yeah. You know, no, no reform. You know, banks they're all they've all been much of a muchness yeah and, and the so, differences so, they, they blow up the differences to be way larger than they really are yes they do have the yes, yes. And I don't, before we get to investment impacts there's only one other thing i mentioned yet or forgot to put in uh, as the one other headwind that is kind of uniquely australian and has some more news flow to it today uh, uh, and that is as we push into the COVID recovery the further into it yeah, the more Chinese decoupling we're going to have to deal with, uh, both in terms of falling commodity prices as China slows into a, what, a global recovery, but just politically, uh, Australia is has pretty much elected to go down a path towards uh, the United States as a, as a strategic partner over the over China, quite sensibly in my view, but uh, the. The economic implication for the next cycle is that we'll be wrestling with Chinese decoupling as well as all these other problems, uh, and that will come to bear pretty quickly. Like, for instance, when the budget foresees the borders, the international borders reopening and tourism and students returning, they won't be coming from China. Mm. You know, that's a, that's almost certain. In the meantime, even today, we're seeing new Chinese blocks on Australian coal. Uh, in, and this time it's coking coal. It's only ever been thermal coal before, which brings Queensland into that um, shit fight. Uh, and so you you know you have China basically trying to divide and conquer the Australian uh, political economy. Uh, and you know we have various conflicts and responses to this, but the general thrust is going to be Chinese decoupling. The political uh, drive for that is strong in the coalition, and and the it's very popular with the voters, basically. I mean, the, the Low Institute survey that was done recently had 94% support wow. for diversification of Australian exports away from China as a policy goal. Hmm. Like 94%, you never see a number like that. So, you know, that's that's what the policies will do. 
So that's just an extra headwind. Very good. Okay, thanks for that, Dave. Um, all right, we'll jump across to the investment outlook, and I'll kick it off actually with a um, a question uh, from from the panel here that that asks exactly that: How do you ex- uh, invest with the discussed themes over the next few years, fellas? Or well, maybe we'll look a little bit closer, but we can always look at, out further as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's difficult. I think I think we think there's a a, a bit of scope at the moment in the uh, in bonds. So we still think there's a there's, uh, we're sort of playing more in the in the middle of the curve. Um, just because there is a bit of a uh, bit of excitement about um, you know markets rallying and and the potentially we could see that the yield sort of at the longer end sort of push back up again, but we, we sort of feel in that sort of uh, five year range there's there's still a fair bit of um, well there's a bit of scope in the Australian market to to take advantage there and then hopefully um, if yields do go a bit higher we'll uh, we'll probably then extend our uh, ex- extend our maturity out and try and pick up a bit of a uh, bit more capital gain from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, stocks are difficult. Um, still a preference for for US. We're sort of we're really, um, as Dave said, you know, we'll have a piece out uh, later on this afternoon just on this uh, third quarter reporting season. Yep. So while the official third quarter reporting season is only kicking off, um, uh, I think tomorrow we get the first one in the US. There's there's it has actually been a bunch of companies with different balance with different balance dates that have reported over the last month or so. There's about fifty or so in the in sort of the the MISCI world, fifty of the large cap ones, and so um, we're really sort of paying attention to that because what we're thinking with in terms of the stocks is that the third quarter is going to be pretty close to to you know life as we know it under under coronavirus. Um, you know your first quarter. Um, we didn't have coronavirus for most of it. Second quarter, we're all into lockdowns and shutdowns and everything was all sort of, um, you know, everyone was, every, all countries were trying to put in these new measures. <laughs> Whereas the third quarter, you know, starting from sort of that June, July, August or, or July, August, September quarter, um, you really have seen, you know, this is this is what we're in for. Um, you know, c- company, countries are sort of semi-open, things are sort of getting back to normal, but, but, not, but not normal. And, um, you know, until we see, um, you know, uh, you know, a fair bit of fair bit of movement on the on the vaccine, which could easily be years away. Um, you know, this is this is life as we know it, and so we're very much um, you know watching that. And to date, it's um, you know you you are seeing that I guess the K-shaped recovery is the the key one, um, where uh, you know things that are in um, consumer uh, consumer facing sort of the uh, consumer staples companies. So you know your restaurants, sorry not your restaurants, your um, uh, your supermarkets and, and and those types of companies they they've been reporting quite well. Mm. Uh, a lot of the tech companies have been reporting quite well, mm. um, but then outside that it gets gets pretty uh, gets pretty hairy. And certainly, um, so so we're sort of looking at that. We're also looking a lot at at how far away companies are from the, where they hit in 2019. And David alluded a little bit to that earlier, but um, you, know, you look through the Australian market and, and it's looking like it's going to do about you know the median company is going to be down about 20 percent um, next year. So. In, you know the 2021 earnings are going to be 20 percent below 2019 earnings still whereas the us is actually looking like um you know the median company is going to be uh, back to its 2019 earnings mm. by, by next year that probably doesn't include some tax um tax hikes if, if biden gets in so um you yeah, know there is room to move on that but um you know, equity markets are certainly very expensive but we're we're we're, we're very focused on on really what's going on at the ground level and, and sort of really getting into those um into those reporting numbers and seeing where there are companies that you can actually pick up um, that have pretty decent outlooks, regardless of uh, coronavirus or not. Fantastic. All right. Thanks very much. Anything further to add, gents? No. Pretty much, no. Uh, a wrap. All pretty good. Um, not going to not going to push this new political movement that seems to be growing on your site, fellas. <laughs> Just in- oh, bring it <laughs> on. I, mean, I have to go get out there and, and do do something. I mean, we would, but we're a bit busy. But yeah, we're sort of stuck in uh, stuck in lockdown too, so <laughs> <laughs> under house arrest. Well, sorry, what's uh, yeah, I've, I've lost you guys. What what are you, what are we talking about? What's oh, there's that? a oh, no, there's some gyrations on a on a new political party um, that's been uh, muted in the in the comments of, of macro business recently. All right, been following okay. doing it. <laughs> so anyway, it sort of fell into place with a, a, a question there earlier about what should we be doing going forward. I thought it might have come up, but anyway. <laughs> I think it's called the Australian Bullshit Party or something. I wasn't going to say it, but anyway, yep, thanks for that, David. Yep. (laughs) 
All right, very good. Oh, look, thanks very much, gents. Uh, and that leads us to our question of the week. So the viewer question of the week today is, do you think this budget is setting Australia up for long-term success or, in fact, has it sabotaged our, our chances? Uh, feel free to drop in your answers in the question. Uh, sorry, in the comments below. Um, and uh, we can work through those and uh, and take it from there. Uh, thanks again, gents, for your time today. A, a terrific uh, run through of a what appears to be a bit of an ordinary budget. But anyway, um, we'll uh, sure we'll have plenty to chat around uh, its effects as they start to to fall into the economy. Uh, coming up next week, we have, uh, of course, uh, Professor Steve Keen back on the show, live from Thailand. Uh, sorry, when I say that, this week, Thursday, um, with a focus on a slightly different topic for Nucleus Investment Insights. It's climate change. Uh, Steve has recently penned a journal article on the, on his, in his terms, appallingly bad neoclassical economics of climate change and the current economic models of the effects of global warming that have been drastically underestimated. Yeah, he joins us on the show to discuss his thoughts on the pitfalls that emerge when mainstream economists potentially undercook the impacts and the subsequent risks on for global demand shocks, including world stock markets. So that's, of course, this week, this Thursday, 12.30pm live uh, on the 15th of October. And uh, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash webinar to ask questions to have them answered along the way. So thanks again uh, for... Of course, anyone that's uh, popped in a, a terrific amount of questions today. So that's been uh, a wonderful uh, amount of input. And thanks very much for following in live. We hope you've enjoyed it and gotten something out of it. And uh, of course, if you want to see more of our content, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash content to stay up to date on news from us. Follow us on social media. We always appreciate guest or topic suggestions. So if you've got one, please drop them in the comments of today's YouTube video. And finally, if you know anyone who'd get something out of today's episode, feel free to share with a friend, let them know about it and help our show grow. So on that note, thanks very much for tuning in and we'll look forward to catching you on Thursday. Cheers. <laughs>